Spring. Okay. So my name is Nicole Signoli, and I'm the director of the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. And I welcome you to section two of our Connecticut Industry and Innovation Program here with Arthur Gartlieb. It's a lecture series that we have every other Wednesday going through um, September. Um, to this is um, brought to you by the Friends of the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. They are definitely looking for help and volunteers. They have a book sale coming up later in the year, but they're always looking for someone um, to help sort books and do that type of thing. So on that note, I would like to um, please welcome Arthur Gottlieb. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> um, if you were with us last week, I hope you enjoyed our last presentation. Um, here is one that is, uh, I think, one of my favorites. A lot of people are interested in this because it seems like there are many people, thank you so much, there are so many people who know someone uh, who are, have a family member who worked at Sikorsky. And um, although I don't think a lot of people know about the history of Sikorsky aircraft beyond the fact that you pass it all the time, uh, on your way uh, to the merit to the Wilbur Cross, or maybe from the fact that, um, you know, there it is, is part of our big politics in Connecticut as a defense industry. So let me go to my screen share and bring up the program. All right, so can everybody see my slide? Yes, I can see it. Thank you so much. And uh, so <clears throat> here's our first slide. I thought I'd start off with a Time Magazine cover uh, picture of uh, Igor Sikorsky and uh, with a bunch of helicopters whizzing around in the background. Um, and that was Time Magazine's thing. I remember I have, uh, a Time Magazine cover from Harry Truman and there were a bunch of televisions around his head because he was supposedly the first president who made wide use of uh, people seeing him on television. So you'll see that um, in some of my earlier slides, uh, I'm, I'm spelling Sikorsky with an I. It's, it's just that where I picked up these pictures, it, it seems like the photographs I have of him in his native country uh, which is uh, in Russia, in Ukraine, actually, specifically, is it's spelled with an I. And then later on, I don't know if it became Americanized or what it was, it became a Y. So it's not a misspelling. And I guess you're famous if you're on the cover or of Time magazine, uh, perhaps infamous also, but not the case is for Igor Sikorsky. I would just go with famous. So like I was saying, uh, Sikorsky Aircraft, um, now a subsidiary of Lockheed Martin. It's a big defense industry in uh, the state of Connecticut. Uh, that aircraft that's on the tarmac there, they have a, um, it's a Black Hawk and they have Black Hawk helicopters on uh, one of them on a pedestal. Uh, when I, one of the places I work, that is actually two of them that are assisted living communities um, are just north of Sikorsky. So I get off the Merritt and get on, what is it, Route 110 over there. And uh, then I pass right by Sikorsky. You can see Black Hawk on the pedestal. And I worked on many Sikorsky aircraft as museum pieces uh, when I was in charge of the aircraft collection uh, many years ago, 30 years ago at the Intrepid Museum when at that time it was the seventh largest aircraft collection in the entire world. Uh, so there were many Sikorsky aircraft under my care. And um, so some of this brings back some memories for me. There is the Sikorsky family uh, back on the, in the old country. as Igor Sikorsky Wright, 
uh, with his sisters and his brother, right? And so there he is, very handsome. Now we're going back into um, what effectively was Tsarist Russia. This is pre-Bolshevik Russia. And let's see, did I date this photograph? No. So. Art, you actually hit your mute. Still muted. There we go. All right. Thank you. And uh, the in pre-Bolshevik Russia, it was like a lot of European countries where you had, if you were part of the aristocracy, you know, you were, had a, uh, a firsthand uh, availability to the military, et cetera. That's why everyone here is in this regalia in military uniform, et cetera. Uh, wasn't that Igor Sikorsky came from the wrong side of the tracks or something. He actually emigrated to the United States to get away from Bolshevik Russia. And, um, but he was one of these young people who was unencumbered about figuring out what it was he wanted to do with his life because he had a natural talent and a natural ability to know what he wanted to do and to go after it. And that of course was the aviation industry before it was even an industry. He's truly one of the pioneers. And there he is, right? So this is, um, in the early 1910s and you have, there he is, and he's piloting uh, his very first aircraft, which is called an S-1, S for Sikorsky afterwards. And shoot, I mean, if I was designing and building my own airplanes, I would have named it the G-1 and why not? You know, and the thing is with Igor Sikorsky, as you're gonna see here, it's not like he built these things and then he got somebody else to try it, you know, because it's dangerous. Um, he was, he strapped himself right in there, even though I don't mean strapped in because I don't think he is strapped in. This is a pusher aircraft, by the way. With a pusher aircraft, can you see behind Igor Sikorsky? I don't know if you can see my mouse. There's a propeller that's behind him. Right, so in effect, the aircraft is being pushed forward by the thrust of the propeller pushing the, the propeller wash behind, you see? So the aircraft is literally being pushed forward. So whenever you have an aircraft like that, and there are still aircraft like this, it's called a pusher airplane. Not very unusual because typically you'll have the engine uh, towards the front of the aircraft, or on the wing of the aircraft and the propeller will be on the front side of it. And therefore you're being pulled forward. And this is a pusher aircraft. That box uh, over the right shoulder of Igor Sikorsky is the gas tank. That's the gas tank. And it's a simple gravity feed for the gasoline to go through the tube to the engine, all right? And these aircraft here had very rudimentary controls. Um, you know, the way that you actually banked the aircraft, I don't know how many of you know anything about flying or have ever piloted an aircraft. Um, but to be able to bank the aircraft, you have to have, in this case, the wings actually twist in opposite ways to affect the airflow to put the aircraft into a left-hand bank or a right-hand bank. And that in conjunction with the rudder is how you make a turn in an airplane. There he is. And there's his sidekick. I got this guy's name in one of the, up uh, in the next slides. I can't remember it, right? And there's Igor Sikorsky and he's, you know, these were open cockpitted aircraft back in these days. So, you know, you got to dress up a little bit. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where the wind was blowing past your ears at a high rate, but it can be quite painful. Uh, I've only experienced that not in an aircraft, but, but on the deck of a ship um, 
in high winds and it's you have to cover your ears and he's also wearing kind of like a rudimentary helmet there and this fellow over here doesn't seem to be concerned with it there's igor sikorsky you look at him look take a look at his face i mean yes the counselor in me looks at people's uh their unspoken behavior you know and he's got like a real confidence about what he's doing here's another one Right now, here's another aircraft, uh, Igor Sikorsky at the controls of his S-5. So this is his first aircraft, his first design to fly successfully and upon which he learned how to pilot an aircraft, right? So I guess those ones before that, he never had any actual training in flying an aircraft. But to get an aircraft off the ground and to be able to pilot it successfully, in other words, control flight and then land it, um is a pretty big deal uh and it's a big deal today as much it was it was a big deal then except nobody was doing it then maybe the wright brothers or a handful of other people you know were getting aircraft to fly for you know a modicum of seconds and then land again uh and be lucky not to have been killed in the process uh, this is aircraft to the left now, you see, and it's in front of him, so the aircraft is being pulled. There's that cylinder filled with the gasoline once again. And uh, you see, I like the old days because you see, there's people get dressed up for this stuff, right? Now, if this is the guy's wearing a suit and tie, Igor Sikorsky's wearing like a suit and tie here. If that was me, I wouldn't be wearing a tie, right? Certainly not a suit. And here we go, here's another shot. There's that fellow again, by the way. Here is Igor Sikorsky, and he's got this flat hat on, and he's wearing a nice overcoat, always well-dressed, I might say. Um, and V.S. Panasiuk, right? And I made pains to make sure I spelled that right. And Igor Sikorsky with the Ilya Murome. This aircraft, made a historic 1,600 mile round trip from St. Petersburg to Kiev and back. Pretty big deal, right? Because, you know, the aircraft industry was, I mean, it was, people were playing with it. They would, thought they were toys, you know, and uh, the first generation of aircraft pioneers were going to prove that not only was it practical to fly, but you could make it into a uh, a reliable form of public transportation. Uh, you can use it for commerce, you can use it for industry. I mean, it wasn't until aircraft were really deemed practical here in the United States. I mean, when we had, um, uh, we had Charles Lindbergh, right? And then he flew all the way across the Atlantic, which, which would suggest that an aircraft could take you safely from one continent to the other. And then, of course, they were flying the mail with it after that, you know, and we used them as warplanes in World War I. Uh, but these people like Igor Sikorsky were truly the pioneers, right? Igor Sikorsky was trying that, to figure out how to get an aircraft to fly, like Thomas Edison was figuring out how to make a light, bur light bulb burn continuously for a practical length of time. That was the mindset of these people. Nice picture, isn't it? Once again, Igor Sikorsky wearing his leather suit. You know, the leather, by the way, wasn't just a fashion thing for pilots and people, you know, working in an industry like this. They were, well, not that it was an industry then. They cut the wind, you see. That's what good was good about leather. As far as the business of the fingers inside the coat, I don't know what that's about. A lot of this, a lot of this generation, of photographs from the late 19th century, early, early 20th century, especially the late 19th century. You see people with their fingers in their coat, like Napoleon, you know, I don't know what that was. You know, maybe he's checking his emails. I don't know. So here it is, here's an aircraft called the Grand, right? And this aircraft over here, right, as shown at St. Petersburg, 
This is the world's first four engine aircraft. Okay, multi-engine aircraft, but not just multi-engine as in more than one engine, but the four engines on an aircraft. What made Igor Sikorsky famous in this industry was the fact that he was creating multi-engined aircraft. And that is what he was really a pioneer in. This whole business of the helicopter came later and uh, but this is what he became famous for, you know, and if you're in the business of inventing things, you have to start off with an idea of something that came before to use as an example. Right. So that is why the body of this aircraft, which in aircraft terminology, we would call a fuselage. Right. It is actually looks like a boat hull. Because, I mean, what other kind of model are you going to use if you're going to have some kind of a structure that's going to go through air, right? You know, you'll use an example of something that came before it, which was something that was going through water, which is a boat hull. And uh, that's why it kind of looks like, at least to my eye, like a boat. Very large, sophisticated engines now by 1913, you see? You know, and you see these propellers, by the way, these propellers were manufactured by, by carpenters and they were carefully chosen select pieces of wood and they had to be carefully machined by carpenters, right? And into a shape and a size and they had to be perfectly balanced like a car tire is balanced or else they would rattle and it would actually destroy the, probably it would rip the engine right off the frame of the aircraft. And um, they were a real level of craftsmanship that went into everything that you're looking at here. Every single thing that we're looking at in this aircraft had to be hand built. And there he is behind the controls, Igor Sikorsky. Very serious looking, right? If I was him, I'd be serious looking too, right? Igor Sikorsky is at the control of the Grand in 1913. So, but there's a lot of changes going on in Russia. I mean, it's starting in 1914 through 1917. Russia is involved in the First World War, as you know. And then in 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution, the, Russia removes itself from the First World War. So somebody like Igor Sikorsky is very important because he represents Russia in this leading pioneering field of aviation. Now, Igor Sikorsky is not happy with the change in politics that are going on in Russia um, because Igor Sikorsky is somebody who kind of like wants to be left alone as a independent entrepreneur. And if you know anything about Bolshevik Russia, anything like the individual is going to be subsumed by the collective, you see? And that was the rub for Igor Sikorsky. You know, if you've ever seen Dr. Shivago, and you probably have, you'll, you'll understand what's going on in Russia very soon. There's another shot of him in front of that. I think it's the same aircraft, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe not. Good picture. Here's that round trip flight, by the way, of the Ilya, right, from Kiev to St. Petersburg. See it? That's a pretty big deal back in those days uh, to be able to make it almost 2,000 miles and still be alive to talk about it. Um, very, very pioneering effort by Igor Sikorsky. And obviously, Kiev is big time in the news, isn't it? So, so he's gone, Igor Sikorsky, right? Bolshevik revolution occurs. Igor Sikorsky, like many people before Nazi Germany, uh, made it impossible for you to get out of there. He had the means to get out of 
Russia, and he did. And there he is in lower Manhattan, right, uh, 1919. And uh, there is in the background, if I'm not mistaken, that is the Woolworth building, if you know where that is. And um, there he is. It's a great picture, isn't it? Look at the old cars. Isn't that something? So it's right around the same time that, um, no, that's not true. About 10 years before my grandfather came over from, once again, from Kiev, except my, my grandfather was a fugitive. Now, I got a couple of quotes from Igor Sikorsky, not a lot of them, but a few. You know, and he had an opinion about these things. You can see how this is gonna be completely incompatible with the notion that any individual talent is going to be immediately, immediately you know, usurped by the collective good of the whole. You see what I mean? So Igor Sikorsky always felt and says here, creative work remains a tremendously vital factor in the progress of mankind, right? The work of the individual still remains the spark which moves mankind ahead, see? Now, this would be enough of a, of a comment to get you thrown in chains, you know, in the Bolshevik revolution. So you see the, you know, you see the rub here. Um, now, so here you have this great photograph taken inside a chicken coop in Long Island. And this is the beginning of Sikorsky Aviation, right? And um, I have a kind of a personal memory. My, my Russian grandparents, my Ukrainian grandparents, they had a chicken farm in New Jersey. And when I was doing my first work on cars and things like that, I had no place to do it. It was far away, but uh, I used to do it inside one of the old chicken coops on their property. It was a poultry farm. And, but here you have Baron Nicholas Solovyov on the left and Jimmy Viner, which is Sikorsky's nephew, in the chicken coop turned machine shop at the Utgoff farm on Long Island. You see? So this is like, you know, this is like Sikorsky's Menlo Park, if you will, right? They've got a chicken coop and uh, he's got this uh, chalkboard there with all of these mechanical computations on it or drawings. And um, they are designing and manufacturing things that never existed before, like multi-engine aircraft, you see? And they're fabricating absolutely everything by hand right there. Talk about humble beginnings, right? So here they are, here's the crew in front of this aircraft that's being put together. And um, you can see how the entire thing is made of by hand, you see. And then it's, they stretch this fabric over it. And then they paint the fabric with the stuff that used to call airplane dope. I don't even know if that still exists anymore. It's kind of where the term dope comes from. If you, I guess people used to huff it and, you know, see things that don't really exist if that's your your game you know and uh it's pretty nasty stuff frankly probably causes brain damage and uh i remember when i was a kid my brother had his own airplane and i used to hang around at the airport while he was flying and uh, there were these old airplanes around on the tar on the field and uh they many of them were covered in this fabric right, the doped fabric, and I, I would pluck them with my finger to, because it made this kind of like this thumping sort of drum sound, right, and then I was, you know, dressed down afterwards, because you're not supposed to do that to the airplanes, like that stopped me, you know, and you can see the, um, these engines, these are like copies of something that we had now, it built it in mass in the United States and in Europe, called Liberty Engines, 
And they were the kind of modern engines that were used in aircraft um, during World War I, you see. So that part had already been kind of figured out. These are big engines. They're not air-cooled engines either. Um, they're, they had to be liquid-cooled. And which means that you had, they have essentially like a car radiator uh, in front of them. That's what you're looking at in this, this rectangular box under this engine, you know. And there's the crew. And here's what it looks like in the next slide when it's completed. You see it? So there it is with the skin on it. And it's this big monster, this airplane, multi-engined. And there's the very sophisticated, like I told you, the propellers, uh, which I could do, um, I could bore you to tears talking about propeller uh, aerodynamics. And there is Igor Sikorsky, though, in the front with Elizabeth Sikorsky, his wife, in front of the newly completed S-29A. And this is what Igor Sikorsky became famous for, these big flying aircraft. Um, in especially, he pioneered something else, which is called the flying boat. Right, so he would take these big airplanes and then he would fashion them on pontoons and he would turn this aircraft, the fuselage of the aircraft into a boat hull and that could actually land on water. And that is really where Igor Sikorsky uh, grew his name in the aviation field. And here's a bunch of characters inside this aircraft, right? And they're all out, you know, it's a very small group of people who are like totally into this. You know, I watched this movie the other day about Steve Jobs, right, um, with uh, Ashton Kutcher. I thought it was pretty well acted, actually. But the point I'm making is that, you know, these, these kind of like this small group of misfit eggheads, if you will, and I mean that with affection, not with derision. I mean, you could count them on both your hands. I mean, there's just not a lot of people who are into what you're into. When it comes to this aviation stuff, these people might as well have been the, the first 13 astronauts, you know. And so everyone's into it. And it's a big deal. They're taking a, a flight in this aircraft. It's a very small group of people. And here's a perfect example of the early aviation career and industry of um, Igor Sikorsky, right? There is a Sikorsky S-38, if you can see it up here in this slide, over Hawaii, right? Because the inter-island airways, which I guess did, you know, who knows, tourists, uh, a business around the Hawaiian islands in the 1930s, had bought these things because they were excellent flying boats. You know, they didn't exactly have the infrastructure in a lot of places to have airports everywhere. So you could just land someplace on, on the land and then have this crew come up and fuel your airplane. I mean, you literally had to land in the water and then taxi up to a buoy. And then people would come and they would fuel the aircraft from a different fueling craft. You see, so it became very, very useful and safe, rather, to have aircraft that could land on war. I mean, out in the Pacific Ocean, the Hawaiian Islands are like 2,400 miles west of uh, the coast of California. And yeah, it'd be kind of a good if you were flying out there to have a boat in case something happened to one of your engines. At least you could land on the water. Here's a beautiful picture. I love this over Manhattan. You could never fly over Manhattan like this now, right? And this is called the American Clipper over New York City. You see it? Great picture, isn't it? And you can see that this is one of the classic early Sikorsky flying boats, right? You got that big wing on the top, multi-engines. Uh, you've got that characteristic boat hull. And that's what it is. It's a boat hull. And then you've got these two tail booms and then the back of the aircraft, you know, the empennage with the control surfaces, the rudder, the elevator, that sort of thing. In other words, to change the pitch of the aircraft up and down and to yaw it left or right. Okay, that's all the way in the tail. 
And uh, on the outboard of the wing, you have these outer, uh, these outer pontoons, right? So while the boat is actually sitting on the center hull when it's in the water, you know, it's, it might tip one side or one the other, and that's what those two outer pontoons are designed to control, okay? But that is a classic Sikorsky flying boat right there. And here, right in Sikor right at Sikorsky, right at the current where the current current factory is located, um, there is Igor Sikorsky on the left side of our photograph, right over here. And that is a hull being built of an S-40. I mean, they build them like boats under construction in Stratford, Connecticut. And this is circa 1931. And, um, you know, it's quite the operation here. Now, inside these aircraft, you are catering to a certain crowd with this, okay? This isn't for mass transportation. These are people who have enough money to be able to get on an aircraft and fly someplace that they didn't have to be, okay? Which is, you know, you had a lot of people from the 1920s and even into the 1930s, if you didn't jump out a window, during the day of the stock market crash or the week afterwards, okay? I mean, this was catering to a nice group of people who traveled around the world from the sheer um, adventure of it, okay? The Pan Am American, uh, the Pan Am Airways that went overseas to places like China, Okay, or they in the used to call it the Orient. It sounds very exotic today. That's got a pejorative ring to it, so we always have to refer to it as Asia. Okay, and um, they would be the ones who were on these aircraft, and they were they were well fitted out inside. You see all the wood veneer in there. I don't know if you know anything about wood. Veneer is a a thin layer of wood that is actually machined off of a log of wood and uh, it's very, very thin and then they'll glue it onto some surface. Remember, this is an, air, an aircraft, so it has to be light as possible. So they're not going in, they're not putting like major pieces of lumber on aircraft. They're, they're using very, very thin pieces of wood that have to be adhered onto some kind of a substrate material, probably some sort of aircraft aluminum, okay? And um, yet at the same time, the whole thing is varnished and, and it's highly flammable, okay? And that's just the nature of the game here. And then back in those old days, I mean, you have to have the ashtray. You see the ashtray? I mean, the ashtrays were still everywhere because, you know, that's back in the old days when smoking was still good for you, you know? And personally, on an aircraft, I think it's always important to have a lit cigar while you're sitting on top of 3,000 gallons of high octane aviation fuel. I mean, that's always seems like a good idea to me, right? And the you see the backgammon table, and you know, and it also reminds us that you know, in like 1931. Uh, you know, people weren't exactly sitting there checking their emails. You know, I mean, you had to have something to do. All right. I, mean, I remember my grandparents, what did they do? They, they, if they weren't watching television, uh, they were like mostly playing cards because that's what people did. They played cards, they did board games, right? Uh, before we had our sophisticated 24 seven in entertainment, okay? So here is one of the consultants from Pan American Airways which were buying Sikorsky flying boats for the reasons why I was just discussing the Pan Am Clippers, okay? And you have one Charles Lindbergh who is the, you know, visiting Igor Sikorsky here. And he is advising Igor Sikorsky about the best characteristics that some large flying boat for passenger service should have on behalf of Pan American. 
And Charles Lindbergh, of course, is still young. And he's right around the time where he's about to become a pariah in the United States. And if I ever do for you or you're able, ever able to join me in my presentation on Charles Lindbergh, I'll explain that to you with detail. And Charles Lindbergh was in, um, I don't know, he kind of got out of town with his wife and, and they lived in Europe because after the Lindbergh baby paparazzi, you know, they literally drove them insane with attention because of the Lindbergh baby affair. And while he was in Europe, the American government asked him to keep an eye on the burgeoning Nazis who were obviously building an air force and everything else. So Charles Lindbergh was, he went over to kind of spy on them. And what happened was he actually became very enamored with the Nazis. And he became part of something in the United States called the America First Committee, which essentially said, well, whatever the Nazis do, you should just let them do it, right? If they take over France, if they take over the whole continent, if they take over Great Britain, what business is it of ours? And by the way, if we are going to fight somebody, maybe it shouldn't be the Nazis, you see? And that was something that seemed highly anti-American. And uh, it really aggregated, aggravated Franklin Delano Roosevelt. As a matter of fact, Charles Lindbergh was a, I think he was a major in the Army Air Force before that. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt, right at the eve of war, 1939, 1940, to punish Lindbergh for his anti-American views, which he considered seditious by that point, FDR, he actually rescinded uh, Lindbergh's commission in the United States Army Air Forces, leaving him essentially wingless as far as the military was concerned. You know, it's a whole story, interesting stuff. But there he is, Charles Lindbergh, talking to Sikorsky about you know the characteristics that should be in a big flying boat for Pan Am. Oh, and here's a great picture of Igor Sikorsky, by the way. Uh, not Igor Sikorsky, rather, um, I should say Charles Lindbergh and his wife. And they're right on the Housatonic River, not far from uh, where Sikorsky is right now. Yeah, 1934. Here's a great picture of something that's called the China Clipper, right? And the China Clipper, right, this is an S-42 this, so they standardized this design. So this is a typical Sikorsky flying boat. And this is bought by Pan American and run by Pan American. And they call them the China Clippers, by the way, to evoke the old days of the China Clippers when they had Clipper ships, you see? Those big, beautiful sailing vessels that would fly back out and forth to China to get tea. And uh, they were fast. And that was good when you have a perishable item like tea. So to harken back to those earlier days of the beautiful clipper ships, they called them the Pan Am China Clippers. You know, a Pan Am, when they were flying these big boats, they had to figure out how they were going to um, attire the, the crew on the boat. Okay, I mean, it, it's not gonna be the same as if you have like an irregular airplane, right? And you have what we, today we call flight attendants. You know, on the boats to give it a true nautical feel, what they did was they put everybody in like this yachting attire, you see? So everybody looked like they were getting on a high-end yacht and they had all of this nautical terminology and all the rest of that stuff. It was quite the thing. And here's a, uh, another flying boat that's exactly the same, except this one isn't a China Clipper. This one's called the Bermuda Clipper, right? Because it has just made its inaugural flight straight from New York City, right? And this is on June 18th, 1937. So there you go. You see all these people in their white hats over here because they're, you know, they got the whole, the double-breasted navy blue attire and all the rest of that.
I suspect it was very loud inside those airplanes, you know, with a four engines like that buzzing over your head, right? In the water when you're taking off or you're landing. It, might, it must have been quite the adventure. So here's another aircraft that um, Sikorsky had developed. Now, right around now, by 1939, I mean, we are going to be, you know, in World War II, one way or the other. So Sikorsky um, Martin Aircraft um, Consolidated Volte, they were all manufacturing aircraft that were going to be used, particularly by the United States Navy, uh, for these uh, aquatic missions, either in the Pacific or in the Atlantic for search and rescue, for transport, all the rest of these things, right? The largest of these aircraft were, that was ever conceived, of course, was Howard Hughes's uh, aircraft, the Hercules, right? It was something that never was put into production, but it was enormous, called the Spruce Goose because it was made at, literally out of wood uh, because aircraft aluminum was at such a premium. It's one of the ways he sold the funding for it. Fascinating stuff. But all of this technology went right into World War II production. Uh, here is uh, Sikorsky's family. Um, Sikorsky family in 1938, Igor Jr., Elizabeth, George, Nikolai, and Sergei. And there, right here in Connecticut, is Igor Sikorsky in with his pet project, okay, which is this gadget that he's trying to get to not only hop off the ground, but once it's hopped, to actually stay off the ground, right? So he's right back where he was in like 1910 with his aircraft. Except now, I mean, this is his pet thing. He's been thinking about this for decades and he's got the, the funding, the time, uh, the knowledge to actually make it a reality. But somebody has got to invent the thing first. See what I mean? The helicopter was not something that actually existed. And there's Igor Sikorsky now, right? So this is the VS-300, the first capable, the first craft capable of making short hops off the ground, right? And you know, people down in Stratford, I've heard people tell me that when they were a kid, they remember Igor Sikorsky like hopping around with this thing out there in the flats down by, by where Chance Vaught is. Um, or down by this air, this airport down, I guess it's, what is that, Lordship Boulevard down there? Off of 95, if I've got that correct, forgive me if I don't have it correct. Here's another Igor Sikorsky quote. This machine was a failure to the extent that it could not fly. Okay, period, stop. In other respects, it was very important and necessary stepping stone, right? So there you have it says, you know what? This thing doesn't work, but it was absolutely critical for us. And this is, gives, gives us an insight into the mind of the, um, uh, the practical mechanic slash inventor, right? Uh, the best example I can think of would be like Thomas Edison. And people were like chiding Thomas Edison for having worked so just just for month after month, year after year, trying to figure out the proper combination of a filament. And it's an enclosure vessel, in other words, a light bulb, to, to actually have a filament that when you apply electricity would not only illuminate, but stay illuminated for more than like 10 seconds. You see, and he went through about a hundred of these combinations until he finally found the right one in an actual vacuum of air. And um, people says, well, you know, do, are you, 
do you feel bad that you failed the first 99 times? Was that a waste of time? And, he, and Thomas Edison was like, absolutely. He says, I didn't fail 99 times. He says, I learned 99 things that wouldn't work. So therefore, it's not a failure. You see what I'm thinking? That's the exact same thinking here. And that's what you need. I would call it persistence. Now, here's another shot. I mean, by 1940, Charles Lindbergh's toast. Okay, I mean, the only thing he's got is his consulting job with, um, you know, Pan Am, essentially. He's already a pariah. And by 1940, he's already gotten hammered by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and is considered like a seditious individual. But of course, there is, there he is with um, Igor Sikorsky in front of the VS 300, 1940. And here we have what probably is the first practical helicopter, right? And um, this is very important, right? So this aircraft, May 6, 1941, right? Before the United States is actually involved directly in World War II, right? Igor Sikorsky breaks the world helicopter flight endurance record, right? Because other people are working on these things. The Germans were working on these things. And this aircraft remained in the air for one hour, 32 minutes and 30 seconds, right? Not that anybody's counting, right? And so I don't know what made them come down after one hour, 32 minutes and 30 seconds. You know, I mean, I don't know if they just decided that if it stayed up in the air for an hour, 32 minutes and 30 seconds, it would stay in the in the air, uh, fuel permitting for 10 hours, 32 minutes and 30 seconds. I mean, that may just have been the case. OK, um, but there you have it. I mean, if you can control an aircraft. Uh, and these things, they were called helicopters. Before that, they were called rotogyros. Um, and it's a pretty big deal. And, and Sikorsky is the one to do it, you see. Now, the key to this whole thing, right? I want you to stop and put your engineer hat on for a minute. Uh, you know that helicopters, as you can see it here, you can't see it very well, but you, you're perfectly aware that helicopters have a um, a propeller that's all the way on the aft under the tail boom, right? That is actually blowing sideways, you see? In addition to the main rotor assembly that is over his head, as you can see, right? And I want you to think about for a minute, like for instance, like what keeps an, not a helicopter, but think about an airplane. What keeps an airplane in the air, you see? Oh, you have to have some kind of a thrust to make movement over the wings, but that's not enough. The wings have to be shaped in such a fashion where it creates a low pressure system on top of the wing, you see, which then, in other words, equates to a vacuum, you see. So what happens is that the, the air mass on top of the wing on a regular aircraft, right, actually creates something called lift, right? So the average, the, uh, an aircraft, is actually held up in the air by the fact that there's a low pressure system above the wing. So in other words, it's actually pulled into the air. That is what we refer to as lift, you see? And you have to have an airflow over the, over the wing, a differential airflow over the wing, over the top of the wing versus the bottom of the wing to create that differential, right? And that is something called Bernoulli's principle, okay? I'll just give you a minute to write that down because I know you're taking uh, dutiful notes. And so in, an, in, a, in a helicopter, how do you create lift, you see? Well, you create lift by combining the actual thrust of an airflow in addition to, in addition to the lift that's created by Bernoulli's principle in the fact that in this case, you have three rotors, you see? And those rotors are spinning and they're acting to do two things, to provide thrust, okay? 
and also to provide lift. Now, to be able to do that, to control an aircraft like this one and actually be able to sit in the driver's seat, right? And actually you have to have a control that changes the pitch of those rotors, right? To change the angle of attack of the air, right? To actually take advantage of the rotational force to create lift, you see? So while this whole assembly is spinning by the force of an engine, you've got to be able to have controls that actually turn the rotors to create lift while the whole thing is spinning. That's not an easy thing to do because nobody ever did it before. Well, that can whole control head mechanism is what Igor Sikorsky perfect. And he patents it. It's his deal, you see. And not only do you have to lift it, because it's not just enough to lift the helicopter, because now you just be hovering over the ground, right? You've got to be able to move forward. And to be able to move forward, now that the aircraft is off the ground, you have to take that entire rotor assembly, and you've got to be able to shift the entire thing forward, right, to change. And we refer to this as vectored thrust, okay? Once again, I'll give you a moment to write that down. Vectored thrust. And um, it's an amazing mechanism. It's an amazing mechanism to be able to, with a handle next to you, control stick, to be able to articulate this whole thing that's rotating at high speed and under tremendous pressure, reliably and consistently. That's what Igor Sikorsky's contribution really is right there. And of course, the propeller in the back, the reason why you have the propeller in the back that's pushing sideways is because I want you to think about this for a minute. You've got this rotational force, right? And it's not to forget about the lift for a minute. Just talk about just the rotational force of it. There's a tremendous amount of inertia, okay? And something that's rotating in high speed. All right. Now, as long as that aircraft is sitting on the ground, it is able to be firmly rooted just by the weight of it on the ground so that that rotational force is creating those rotors turning through the air. And so, in other words, the resistance of the rotors going through the air is less than the resistance of trying to spin the aircraft while it's on the ground because it's firmly rooted on the ground because just of the weight. You see, but as soon as the aircraft lifts off the ground, okay, then the resistance of the fuselage wanting to spin around instead of the engine changes, the whole proportion changes once you release the aircraft from the ground, you see, and then the whole fuselage wants to spin. And that's why you need the propeller in the back to counter thrust the tail of it from wanting to spin. That's what keeps the helicopter straight. You know, it's a tremendous amount of rotational torque in the engine, okay? And the torque has to go someplace. And if, as soon as you lift off the ground, the body of the aircraft wants to spin. If you see what I'm getting at, that's what the propeller in the back is for, right? It seems obvious now, or maybe not. I love this hat that he's wearing. It was just a cartoon I used to watch as a kid, a little stereotypical of the Cold War, right? And you have Borish and Natasha, right? From Rocky and Bullwinkle, right? That's the kind of hat that Boris used to wear. Don't tell me you don't know what I'm talking about. I know you do. See it? <laughs> There's the hat. Right now, once again, if this was me doing a test flight in this aircraft, I don't know if I'd be there in a suit and tie, you know, with the hat, you know, I guess you'd be having to be hold on to that with the engine going and all the rest of that. <laughs> you see, now, by the middle of World War Two, for us anyway, 1943, um, Sikorsky has already designed his first practical helicopter that he's already sold to the military. 
Okay. I mean, they don't emerge until 1946, 1947, you know, and, and people are kind of like, what do we do with this thing? But it has obvious military applications, of course, right? And um, the military applications were seen widely. And if any of you watch the series or the movie MASH, you know, I mean, that became obvious to be able to land into some kind of this, this rugged, hilly terrain uh, under hostile fire that was the Korean War. I mean, there's no, it's almost ideal to have a helicopter that can come straight down into a hot LZ landing zone and to be able to take casualties out from the field and then fly them to a MASH, a mobile hospital unit, okay, where you can get patched up. And then they could take a helicopter and fly you right off the coast. And we had hospital ships waiting, you know, so your ability to stay alive was, you know, uh, considerably even greater than it was only a few years earlier in World War II for these reasons. And of course, in Vietnam, that became the de facto helicopter war, where helicopters actually replaced the cavalry in many cases, you see. If you've ever watched movies about Vietnam, particularly Apocalypse Now, right? as crazy as that was. And this is a search and rescue helicopter, you see, because it has, um, it has an apparatus on the side of the, the aircraft body and with a wind shock, right? right? And these are the kind of aircraft that, I mean, I, not this vintage, but, you know, I was trained in search and rescue by the Coast Guard. And, you know, this was, you had to know how to get people. I was always on, I was never in the aircraft. I was always on a boat or in the water. And the idea was that you had to work with in these operations. I never did it. I never did it really. It was just, you know, obviously we had to train and train and train. And so they would lower a basket and then, or some kind of a harness, depending on the operation. And then you had to be able to, without drowning yourself or drowning the victim, get that person or persons into the rescue apparatus, okay? And then they would be hoisted into the helicopter for search and rescue. And that was all with the Coast Guard. But it's the same exact thing here. And notice that Igor Sikorsky demonstrating the thing himself I mean, you know, I mean, if somebody's selling something to you and they're putting their own life in danger to show you that it works, I think that's a credible argument, you see, and he's there he is sitting in something. I mean, I don't know what they call it here. We used to call these things bosun's chairs, right? It's just a close up. That's pretty cool, you know, and I don't know this guy, but I bet you he was pretty proud of himself. So this day in history, May 4th, uh, May 4th, 1943, aviation pioneer Igor Sikorsky receives a patent for helicopter controls, right? That was that, that control mechanism that still to this day, you look at any helicopter and it's essentially the same exact mechanism. The only difference is, excuse me, how many rotors you'll have. You see what I mean? Which is irrelevant, you know, because it's the mechanism has been designed. You can add as many rotors as you need to. And here is a very happy, smiling, full bird, full, full bird colonel uh, in the Army Air Force in 1943, who was going to take this test ride in you know, which might as well be a rocket ship. I mean, it's, it's one of Sikorsky's helicopters of the same model we saw in the previous photograph. But this one or, has already been bought and purchased by the United States Army Air Corps, you see it? And uh, there's Igor Sikorsky and he looks like he's uh, doing a little sightseeing with his camera there. And they're on a new aircraft carrier, a uh, sister ship to the to the Intrepid where I spent nine years, the USS Bunker Hill, an Essex class aircraft carrier. And they're doing the flight tests um, off this aircraft carrier. And the USS Bunker Hill was to have a very short life 
uh, in 19, I think it was late 1944, took these two kamikaze hits in the Pacific and so knocked it out of action. It knocked it out of the entire war. And the Bunker Hill, unlike many other ships that got so hit, um, actually was so badly damaged that they never put it back into service. Here's Life Magazine, July 21st, 1943, 10 cents. And there is the depiction reads Sikorsky's helicopter, right? It's kind of an odd looking aircraft here, right? So you've got Sikorsky standing underneath it and his left hand is on something called pontoon, right? I grew up across the street from the water and I don't know, I used to see helicopters a lot and, um, and they always had these hot dog looking things that were the pontoons, right? That's what I call them. And except those helicopters were always those kind that you saw in the MASH program, which were Bell helicopters, one with the big bubble, the plexiglass bubble and the two gas tanks. Right, that's what they were, the ones that I saw. But this is kind of an odd aircraft, you see, because it has actually an open cockpit to it. You see it? With a little tiny windshield and this guy sticking his head out over there, right? But Igor Sikorsky now was famous for the helicopter. And this one goes back to the original stuff I was telling you about before about how Igor Sikorsky was a good fit as this, this, this future thinking, forward thinking entrepreneur engineer. He belonged in the United States of America. This is where you wanted these kind of people to be. Uh, and you could only make it here, especially in the late 19th, early 20th century, right? And that goes for the Edisons, that goes for the John Roblings, right? The person who built the Brooklyn Bridge. I mean, you if you were the inventor, tinkerer, um, and wanted to pull together some coalition to back you and become famous in a country that needed, that needed dramatic things done, the United States was the place to be. Uh, the work of the individual still remains a spark that moves mankind ahead even more than teamwork. You know, and to some people, even today, this is, you know, this is kind of a heretical statement, you know, of what's more important than teamwork, you see. And this is an S-51. They had these, a lot of these odd looking helicopters uh, from the late 1940s, you know, into the 1950s. Um, and there's Igor Sikorsky. And remember that it wasn't very long um, after the helicopter was invented that so was a material called lucite or plexiglass, where you were actually able to create these big bubbles of essentially plastic. And uh, you know, what a, what a perfect timing thing that was. You had the front of them on bombers, but look at the way this gives you this 360 degree visibility. Um, being able to look out uh, from this, this plastic bubble. There's Igor Sikorsky. I think he's wearing the same suit he was wearing in the last one. The same control head. Now, here's a very curious photograph. I had to put this in here because after all, it is a Sikorsky helicopter. Uh, this is in 1946, immediately after World War II. And for some reason, a reason why I don't know, there is a very shiny, handsomely painted Sikorsky helicopter on the stage of Radio City Music Hall. Right, so there's a Sikorsky S-52 on stage with dancers at Radio City Music Hall in 1946. I have no idea why that's there. Uh, you know, it is, um, it was actually this marketing idea. I mean, this is gonna sound crazy in retrospect. It was a marketing idea of Sikorsky and others that you were gonna be able to sell helicopters to the average person and the average person was going to be bussing around in these helicopters, right? And, you know, you were going to use it to go to, I don't know, 
uh, places that you use your car to go to, I guess. And we were going, they were going to turn this into a household commercial product, the helicopter. Yeah, in retrospect, I mean, I don't know, I take my life in my hands just driving down the street in, in my automobile with other drivers in their automobiles. Uh, I'd be uh, rather scared to think what it might be like to be flying around in a sky full of people checking their emails when they should be having their eyes on what they're doing. Just saying. Excuse me for a second. <sighs> So maybe that's why that was on the stage over here. Maybe they were trying to popularize it, you know. Korsky is also an author. Here he has an autobiography, right? The story of the winged S, an autobiography by Igor Sikorsky, right? 1958. And these are, this is the first aircraft. I mean, I have one of these in, in our aircraft collection at the Intrepid. And uh, this was a very typical kind of an aircraft that Sikorsky was building, right? The H-19, which was a true workhorse. You know, the thing was like, a, it was like a Model T, you couldn't kill it, you know? And this is the beginning really of the modern age of helicopters right up to the line of helicopters we have right now, the Blackhawk. You know, as far as being, reliable, uh, about being, um, you know, eminently useful, having a high capacity for, for cargo. Uh, you can use it to transport troops or equipment or medical supplies or whatever it could possibly be. Um, and we use them in all of our armed services. And we sold these um, to our NATO allies as well. Right, so these things were all in service with allied air forces or navies. You know, any of you who were in the military who were at least as old as I am or older, you know, I mean, these things were like all over the place. Here's one, another one we had in, uh, in our aircraft collection at the Intrepid. Um, and this is a classic search and rescue Sikorsky helicopter. And this was a very, very successful design. It was used in other services also. And you can see that hoist on the outside of it, which was typical of all search and rescue helicopters, right? This is an uh, H-52 Sea Guard. And you can land it on land because it had landing gear, right? That was retractable. And when you were landing on the water where you can see that it is right now, it was, um, it just landed in essentially what was a boat hull with two outer outrigger pontoons, you see? Extremely successful design, uh, just literally ubiquitous through the, uh, the 1960s into the 1970s. As you can see here, they're using jet engines, right? This is a typical kind of an aircraft. This is Sikorsky Sea Stallion, which is like this massive helicopter, very two jet engines, um, and it, it, it's a, a real military workhorse. And this was in service in the late 1970s, the 1980s, into the 1990s. I saw quite a bit of these, you know, uh, being around all of the shipyards and training centers where I worked. Um, you had the special forces, um, especially the Navy SEALs and others like it would actually show up in one of these huge sea stallions. And all of a sudden this rope would drop down and these people would, I don't know, I know there's a term for it. It's not repelling, that's not correct. But they, these like these seven or eight guys would slide down this rope and it was this fast deployment and then the helicopter would take off, all right? And they would practice this all the time. Here you see it on a, the deck of a moving aircraft carrier, but I used to see them practice with these things all the time. It is very impressive, large aircraft. And the way that these folks would in full, uh, in full, 
you know, military regalia would just like slide down this rope and just be inserted into some kind of a hot zone. Um, you know, if you're interested in that sort of a thing, it's impressive. And of course, what we have uh, around the world today. Uh, this is an echelon of Black Hawk helicopters. Um, and these are the workhorses of the modern military. Um, and, and many of our allies are using these aircraft as the workhorses of their modern military. And um, this was the equivalent to the Bell Huey that you saw in Vietnam, which were just completely, they were everywhere. They were ubiquitous. They were all over the place, right? The Bell Hueys, now the Blackhawk is the mainstay. And it's, it's actually produced in several variants uh, for specific usage for any of the armed services or for foreign services too, right? So there's the UH-60 Blackhawk, right? Uh, here's a very famous uh, Sikorsky helicopter, one maybe most recognizable to people who, you know, don't know anything about helicopters or care about Igor Sikorsky particularly, right? And there is, of course, Marine Corps One, all right? And this is something that, you know, people recognize anytime the President of the United States is uh, getting someplace, he's going locally, or locally meaning, you know, I don't know, I guess less than 500 miles, you know, that would be done in Marine Corps One. And there it is. It's a Sikorsky helicopter. And, uh, and then if you're flying to Andrews Air Force Base to get on um, um, Air Force One, which was the big presidential jet, which is a 747, you know, you'll get there from Marine Corps One. And you can see how it's a seaplane right, not a seaplane rather, but a, a, um, an ocean capable helicopter, right? And uh, you can see how the retractable landing gear retracts into the outer, into the, uh, the outer pontoons. Now, this thing is a big deal, right? These aircraft, when Marine Corps One is being built, when they're building a new one at Sikorsky right here in Stratford, there is an armed guard at that aircraft 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all right? And therefore, no person can sabotage the aircraft when they think nobody's looking or add a bomb to it or heaven knows what. And when, the, when Marine Corps One needs to be upgraded or repaired uh, and is brought back or flown back to Sikorsky, Okay, once again, from the moment that aircraft um, lands at Sikorsky, it is guarded 24-7 for the same exact reason. It, this aircraft is never left unattended by an armed guard to make sure that there's no sabotage to the aircraft. Here's another uh, quote from Igor Sikorsky. Aeronautics was neither an industry nor a science. It was a miracle, right? So here's somebody who was like truly one of the pioneers of aviation. So he has authority to speak like this, right? And basically this was a bunch of trial and error and it's amazing all of us didn't get killed, right? You know, and that's the end of my editorial about that, but it's, it was a miracle. There's the uh, Black Hawk version of a Coast Guard helicopter, right, called a Jayhawk, okay? And, you know, once again, it's specifically fitted out for search and rescue here. And uh, the Air Force, uh, rather the Coast Guard uses quite a bit of these things. We don't see a lot of these around here. Um, um, up in uh, other uh, parts of the country in the Gulf of Mexico, in, uh, up in Alaska, you know, they, they have a heavy presence of these things.
This aircraft, if you can see it up there above the trees, this is something called the Sikorsky Sky Crane. If you've never seen one of these, it's unbelievable. These things are, this was circa Vietnam War, right? Mid 1960s, late 1960s. This is an enormous helicopter. It has the largest payload of a helicopter ever. Tremendous rotor span uh, and lift capability. And it, it could actually lift like an entire command center. It could lift a uh, it could lift a crane, construction equipment, small tanks. It was amazing how much this helicopter could actually lift, and it had a body that was designed to fit around a uh, something that looked like a those trailers that people live in, you know, or a container maybe like you would see from the container ships. Very impressive. And here's one shown right off of uh, Stratford, Connecticut, probably right over the Housatonic River. This was in 1967, where there was probably even a, a, you know, a lot less, I don't know, shall we say suburban sprawl, all right? And this is a, one of the very formidable aircraft that Sikorsky manufactured for the United States Army and for the Marine Corps, okay? Uh, once again, I mean, it's very powerful. It's very fast. It has a huge lift capability to it. And it also has something called a refueling probe on the front of it, which means that you can bring this helicopter up to uh, an aircraft that has trailing a refueling boom. Okay. And this is quite it requires an enormous amount of coordination to do this. You couple the two together between two aircraft and you can refuel the entire aircraft. You know, refueling is something that we do. We, we couldn't run our military without refueling. And we have refueling aircraft all over the place and um, our aircraft, they burn such a prodigious amount of fuel that they have to refuel sometime, at least once while they're in the air, uh, just so they can maintain their operational status and complete their missions. Um, 1967, I'm gonna show you why they call it the Jolly Green Giant, right? It's good to have nicknames for things. It's easy to remember. Boom, that's why. See, so there it is in Army or Marine Corps camouflage. Uh, frankly, I'm not sure which is which here. Um, and so there you have it in action, right? And it is a jolly green giant. Uh, if any of you have been around the military, you've probably seen one of these things. I actually saw one of these things. It's like, it's incredible. It's like the whole sky is black when the thing flies over. Very impressive aircraft. And Sikorsky is, you know, they make incredibly rugged aircraft. Here's a, um, Airmail stamp, I guess that's appropriate since it's depicting Igor Sikorsky. And there's that first aircraft that he had that broke that, that record of staying in the air, what was an hour and a half or whatever it was, right? And there he is, Igor Sikorsky. <laughs> I like this quote, look at this. So people were telling Igor Sikorsky for years that that thing's never going to get off the ground. It doesn't really match the laws of physics that something like a helicopter could fly, right? But Igor Sikorsky being Igor Sikorsky, he keeps trying until he gets it to work. And so here's his, here's his sarcastic kind of response to all of these naysayers. According to the laws of aerodynamics, the bumblebee can't fly either. But the bumblebee doesn't know anything about the laws of aerodynamics, so it goes ahead and flies anyway. I just love that. <laughs> Good for you, Igor. And here's my last slide for you. Um, here's a nice signed photograph of Igor Sikorsky, who was born on May 25th. 1889 and passed on October 26, 1972. So I hope that in the time that we had uh, gave you a 
good understanding of uh, a little bit of a biography on Igor Sikorsky, but also the to follow his career and that he was famous for creating these big flying boats before he was even known for helicopters. All right, so there's my program for you. And we had a couple of questions and Arthur, we had a couple of questions in the chat. The okay. first one came out um, was at the beginning of your program. It was what, um, what year was the 1600 mile um, flight? I think that's the one that was in Russia. Oh yeah, I think I had that written down and I just went out of my program. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that was that was around 19, uh, between 1910 and 1912, if I'm not mistaken. <coughs> Thank I'll, you. I'll double check that for you. I'm so and sorry. We can, I don't we have can check it on to YouTube too. Yeah. Um, I'll, another question, the Cayman, K-A-M-A-N, helicopters use a different blade control mechanism. Did you know such a thing? Helicopters use a different blade control mechanism than what? Then I guess what Sikorsky used, K-A-M-A-N, Cayman, come on, helicopters? I don't know. Me neither. Uh, that, that may be the case uh, with a standard configuration for helicopter rotor controls. I mean, as we saw them, I mean, I wouldn't doubt that there's been something that's been amended to um, to Igor Sikorsky's original design, but he was the one who figured out how to have this major rotating mechanism under high pressure and high speed actually have this instantaneous control to change the pitch of the heli uh, of the rotor blades and then to take the entire head of the mechanism be able to tilt it forward or neutral to actually create forward flight you see what i mean he was i i don't I'm not an expert in helicopters, but I know that. Okay, okay so whatever. Um, Nic what, Nicole, what it, yes, yeah. it's it's Jill, um, Jill Griffin. Um, my mother-in-law was a neighbor of Charlie Command. Oh, and she was the first woman to test pilot his helicopter. Oh, and Charlie Command worked for Sikorsky and went over to Sikorsky and said, "Hey, I have this idea of a alternating." rotating um intermission blades uh, intermission blades and uh sikorsky told him now nah, we don't need that so if you go if you go up to if you go up to new england air museum and i hope you do to see the wasp section the women's air service pilot section which um, my husband's mother's in ann glazer you'll mm -hmm. see a wonderful quote, quote by Charlie Command, right when you go in on the left, there's an exhibit all about Charlie Command and it says something to the effect that if someone tells you not to do something, do it anyhow. Yeah. That was, well, yeah, that I'll tell you, there's, Sikorsky. there's the, the examples of what you just described is, is they're all over the place. I mean, you had uh, Thomas Edison was convinced that his direct current electrical generating system was all anybody needed, where clearly the guy he we had working for him, Nikola Tesla, came up with a better system. But, but Edison's ego wouldn't allow Tesla's design to observe his. So they had a falling out and Tesla went across the street and was grabbed up by uh, Westinghouse. And then they created alternating current, which essentially put Edison practically out of the electricity business. You see what I mean? Right. I can think of 10 examples just like that. You right. know? So Charlie Command, actually, the, the company actually sells parts to Sikorsky still. Mm -hmm. They're yep. still sort of friends. Well, thank you for adding that. Thank you, Jill. Okay. Thank you. And there was another one. What fuel was used for these powerful engines? And I'm going to say that came up at about 320. So this is like the 60s, 70s, 80s. What fuel was used for those powerful well, for jet engines? engines? Mm. JP5. Say that one more time. It's, 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 JP5 is used in, 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 in the jet aircraft, uh, jet engines for helicopters. Okay, JP5. And before that, it would have been high for the piston engines. It would have been high octane aviation fuel. You see, for the for the for the piston engines, right? But for the jet engines of that era, it was it was a fuel called JP five. Perfect. All right. All right. So in an hour and a half, um, I, I hope that was you found that interesting. I did. Okay, and I look forward to seeing you for our next installment. Yep, our next installment.
Absolutely. Um, thank you again, Arthur. I really appreciate it. It was great. And thank you for everyone's questions. My pleasure. And, We're going to uh, be doing you. the uh, electric boat company on and August on August 3rd. Is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Okay. I don't so. even have my calendar, <laughs> but the, excellent. So we'll see everyone there. Don't forget to register and have a great afternoon. Thank you again, Arthur. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.